Dr. Mark Plutkin, thank you so much for your time. Welcome aboard. How are you, sir? Good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm trying something a little different uh, in, this, in this day and age in terms of introducing people, which is uh, I asked an AI for a bio of uh, Mark Plotkin. And it looks good to me. I think, I think this is about right, but I'm going to read it. What we usually do is I introduce the guest and the guest then adds something or corrects it or, or finds maybe, uh, maybe where there's a little bit of a difference. But Mark Plotkin is an American ethnobotanist and author widely recognized for his work in the fields of ethnobotany, conservation, and indigenous rights. He was born in 1955 in New Orleans, Louisiana. That seems a bit rude. <laughs> and grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. He received his Bachelor of Science in Biology from Harvard and a Ph.D., in biology from Tufts. He's a world-renowned expert in Amazonian ethnobotany and is best known for his work on the medicinal and cultural value of rainforest plants, particularly in the area of Amazonian shamanism. Plotkin is the founder and president of the Amazon, Amazon Conservation Team, a nonprofit organization that partners with indigenous communities to conserve biodiversity, protect traditional cultures, and support sustainable livelihoods in the Amazon rainforest. How did ChatGPT do? Right on the money. Nice, nice. I don't think of anything to add. Oh, very cool. Okay. Well, you are a first time guest, Mark. So you get the first time guest question, which I'm looking forward to having reread a couple of your books uh, recently. But question the first Were you a weird kid? Well, yeah, I think that anybody who was interested in esoteric objects were was already outside the mainstream at the outset. I can think very few exceptions to that rule. So um, I, I think all kids kind of feel they're weird. No, I mean, that's kind of being part of what being a kid is. But I was always interested in, particularly in reptiles. And I spent a lot of time in the swamps around my native New Orleans. So I think that definitely had me branded as weird by a lot of my colleagues. And even the ones that uh, were into it at the time have since outgrown it, unlike me. So I guess I'm still weird. Yeah, I was. That was the part that I was particularly interested in growing up in Australia, where there are certainly, you know, reptilian wildlife to play with, but it's not recommended. <laughs> so, as a kid in the swamps, catching snakes and so on, is there any techniques? And how did you learn them? Did you just decide, okay, I'm I'm going to start at the tail and stay away from the head? Were there techniques that you got taught or knew about uh, getting close to some reptiles that? have a pointy end. I think we have the advantage over you guys because there's not quite so many poisonous snakes here. So there's a lot more room for error than there is down under. Uh, however, the, the, the uh, skills that really helped move me along in my career path were not catching snakes, it was catching lizards. Because I was sent to Haiti in the late 70s with a team of graduate students from Harvard to catch lizards. And they were using nooses and traps and everything else. And I thought, shit, I'm same lizards I, I caught in Louisiana with my hands. So I caught more before uh, lunch than they caught in the week prior. And that fueled up further expeditions at their expense in search of lizards and then in search of crocodilians and then in search of the uh, plants and the people that heal. Uh, right. Okay. So the technique for catching lizards is just a little bit more golem. It's just like leap in with your hands and, and grab it. Well, it's a bit of an art and science because you don't want to harm them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just a case of, of pouncing on them and squeezing the life out of them because they're a lot more fragile than bigger reptiles. So on the one hand, you have to be quick enough to get them, but you have to be gentle enough not to hurt them. At least that's the ideal. Nice one, nice one. And so from the uh, from the, the reptilian beginnings, if we move the story into, I guess, early adulthood and your discovery that actually I could do something like this <laughs> as a career. I mean, uh, take us through that part. Well, like my mentor Schultes uh, said on many occasions, if you're not interested in rainforests, uh, hallucinogens and naked people, you're probably in the wrong business. Even if all the guys I started working with it were in breech cloths and are dressing like you and me. But the point being that when I was there and I was there catching reptiles primarily, I just sort of fell in love with the people in the forest uh, because it just seems so much more interesting and so much more unstudied and so much more intriguing as a as a career path. 
Yeah, I'm fascinated by uh, Richard Schultes as a person, and and in which in regards to your podcast that started whatever it was last year or the year before, uh, there's a couple of lovely episodes of biography of this amazing man who's the <clears throat> like the font or the originator of quite a number of people whose life and work, like yours and Wade Davis and Alberto Violdo and other people who I really admire. Somewhere in that story <laughs> is this incredible man um, by the name of Richard Schulte. So for people who are maybe unaware, can you give a, a short biography of, of who he was? Well, Schulte is widely regarded as the father of ethnobotany. As an undergraduate, he went and studied peyote, uh, which was the first in situ st study of peyote as a healing sacrament by the indigenous peoples themselves. Secondly, he, he finished up there and then went to Mexico in search of magic mushrooms, which were just a rumor at the time. In fact, there were scientists who said there's no such thing as hallucinogenic mushrooms. Well, they were wrong. Schultes was right. And more importantly, the indigenous uh, teachers and guides that he had was right. After that, he went to the Amazon and found ayahuasca. Now, ayahuasca uh, was found like ethnobotanists find everything, which is taught to them by their indigenous teachers. But this is quite the hat trick, peyote to magic mushrooms to ayahuasca in one man's life. That's a feat that has never been equal since and probably never will to find these three, not just mind changing, but I would say culture changing, world changing compounds and plants and fungi uh, before the age of about 35. That's pretty spectacular. And Schultes was a hero to many people, not just as students like me, but uh, people much further afield, like Allen Ginsberg, the, the beat poet, or E.O. Wilson, the greatest biologist of the second half of the 20th century, hailed Schultes as their personal hero. So he's quite the remarkable man with a wicked sense of humor and would often say to me, dressed in his white lab coat and his Harvard tie, uh, these indigenous peoples might not have any pants on, but they know more than we do when it comes to healing ceremonies and plants and fungi. Uh, that was just sort of typified the fact that he understood that these unlettered people knew more than we did. And it showed a, a, a humility for somebody who in, in the US, at least that's the pinnacle of the academic pyramid to be a tenured professor at Harvard. And he still said these uh, indigenous groups know more than he did, which was true. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm really interested in, I guess, the anthropological disciplines in general <clears throat> and their journey from not great beginnings in the 19th century, let's say, through the 20th into the 21st. And in, in anthropology, there's an anthropological turn and, and all this kind of stuff about how we think with, how we learn with indigenous cultures in, in a way that's non-extractive, but also in a way that makes their cosmovisions available because it's very difficult to port that into, let's say, an academic materialism. And Schultes is this electrifying moment that I, I want to, I'm trying this on, adventure as a form of epistemology. Because the things I learned, I mean, I've read Wade Davis's books, Lost Amazon, One River, biography stuff of Schultes. And I think when people realize what it was like, which you tell the story in the podcast about basically getting in his car, this reasonably privileged guy from the Northeast and just heading out West in search of peyote. And what was that? The thirties or something. That's pretty yeah, was 36. Yeah. That's an adventure. Do you know what I mean? And he obviously spent years in the Amazon, but there's something about adventure as epistemology is what I'm looking at here. It's this, it's this way of knowing that's outside. He stands in this electrifying moment in between, um, pith helmets and waistcoats <laughs> on one side and, and what came next. And he basically founded just by doing a, a way of, a way of being in the world that can surface, share and celebrate, I think, indigenous wisdom. Would that be fair? Yeah. You know, on the one hand, you have to give him credit for just suspending uh, the, the preconceptions that Indians were primitive people and how can you go live in their filthy teepee and eat this weird cactus and stuff like that. That was a very uncommon view at the time. Now you go to these shamans and you tell them you'd like to try peyote or ayahuasca and they roll their eyes, right? <laughs> so times have changed, uh, for better and for worse. But Schultes really was the pioneer there. I mean, you look at his other colleagues like uh, Gordon Wasson, the, the mushroom master, I mean, Wasson 
got his start with, with magic mushrooms through a paper of Schultes. Uh, Schultes was the one who partnered with Albert Hoffman, the inventor of LSD, to write The Plants of the Gods, which, to my mind, is the most important book on, on entheogens, hallucinogens that will ever be published. Um, so, you know, he was a titanic figure in a lot of ways as a teacher, as an educator, as somebody humble enough to work with and listen to and learn from indigenous peoples who certainly didn't have his academic credentials. I mean, quite the opposite. Yeah. And uh, Argo and Watson's a good example because basically until listening to your podcast last year, which timed really well, I just spent three months in Mexico, Ecuador, and Peru, and I was coming back and I was listening to stuff on the plane and in the drive home, and it was all plants of the gods uh, and all these amazing stories that, in retrospect, maybe I would have had a, a more nuanced context for had I listened to it before, but it was actually a nice blend. But one of the things I learned there was <clears throat> my whole life, I thought our Gordon Wasson was the introduction of magic mushrooms into American culture, but it mm -hmm. wasn't, it was number two. Well, you know, Schultes and Hoffman co-authored the book Plants of the Gods. And so, flashback three years ago, I'm sitting in my office. I can't go anywhere. I can't go back to my beloved Amazon rainforest. What am I going to do? So I thought, you know, Plants of the Gods. And I have two daughters, uh, two lovely daughters. And they said, you know, Dad, podcast is the thing, right? It's not books anymore. It's not documentaries. You really do a podcast. So I took them up on that. And I had all of this stuff... And Schulte was about to retire. I mean, really, his last week in his office at Harvard, he reached into a file cabinet and handed me all of his lecture notes and said, here, you know, carry on. And so that was sort of the inspiration for Plants of the Gods. I had all of this received wisdom from him. I had had a few experiences on my own since then. And I thought, okay, why not turn this into a podcast and reach a broader audience? And, and what's been really... Um, how can I say this, gratifying, I guess, is the response from people. I mean, I've had indigenous peoples tell me that they learned stuff uh, listening to it. I've had doctors tell me they learned stuff listening to it. And that's the point, to put this in an easily digestible form and bring stories to people that may not know it. And uh, I, I had one interesting experience where a group called the Taino, T-A-I-N-O, who were the group that met Columbus when he landed in the Bahamas, uh, if you look at the literature, they went extinct, you know, shortly after Columbus's visit. And I said this in, in one of the episodes, and I got an email from a guy who said, I'm a Tayuna, we're still here. <laughs> so I took pride in correcting that and pointing out that I was wrong. So, you know, this is what I like is to have this sort of interactive aspect to this type of information sharing. I mean, that's what we're doing here, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. I broader audience down under that I wasn't reaching before. And oh, likewise, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like with my friend Rosita Arvigo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rosita, oh, that was, that was an interesting one last month or whenever I had that conversation because I was in a cyclone in Wellington, New Zealand. And so you could see the ferns going like this behind me, talking to someone in Belize. And it was because we were quite concerned that the internet connection on her end of things wouldn't be great, but it turned out to be mine. That was the problem. But I think it's, uh, when I think back to your podcast and when I was listening to the first couple of seasons, because mercifully it's back, uh, on my drive, I was giving a presentation about cunning traditions at a conference on the mainland. And mm -hmm. I got to tell everyone at the conference afterwards, the, just the process of driving there, I would learn things with each episode, as you said, that the podcasts are where it's at, that I, like Palm, are you, there's a whole episode about Palm that I'm like, oh, this one, this one's not going to be as exciting. And then it was. <laughs> this remarkable, this it's remarkable. one of my episodes. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But, you know, I, I decided to talk about Palm because when you live in the rainforest, a lot of your life is based on palms. You're sleeping under palm leaves. Uh, you see palms used as medicines. Your backpacks are woven from palm leaves. So, yeah, I thought they were much overlooked. And, yeah, um, absolutely. All over the world, this, this, and now since then I was just in the Philippines uh, for work, and there are palms there as well being used as for baskets and construction. And now I know that this is this, this amazing plant ally we've had for tens of thousands of years that is food and medicine and shelter and, you know, part of our, uh, religious traditions, and, and yeah, this it's it's an amazing show, and this this 
you get that sense of wonder, that, I guess, lineage of wonder about um, the world from Schultes, from that idea of plants of the gods into it. Because the poem, I mean, if you think of the Bible stories, it is literally a plant of God. I mean, that we have, we're actually at Palm Sunday, that moment in the year, uh, well, we just went past it. You think, hang on, <laughs> here's this plant that uh, actually- sacred to, Islam, sacred to Islam as well, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, I, I hardly want Gordon, to you and your listeners to read Schulte's paper, Palms and Religion in the Northwest Amazon, which was the inspiration for that piece. Okay, so I will. Just one of his best, most popular articles, so much overlooked these days. Yeah. But well, I, I have a question for you. I just did an episode on tobacco, which I called the sacred shamanic plant of uh, freedom and enslavement. And I've been rather shocked by the fact that it hasn't proven more popular. And when I asked one of my friends about that, he said, well, you know, people think of tobacco as sort of this naughty weed. It's not really shamanic. It's not really hallucinogenic. And when I talked to my colleague, uh, um, Glenn Shepard, who's a great ethnobotanist in Peru, he says, if they don't think it's hallucinogenic, they haven't been taking enough of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I listed that one with great interest because when I was in Ecuador, um, as an ex-smoker long ago, um, I quit almost 10 years ago, I suppose, sitting in ceremony with the Shua in Ecuador, it began with tobacco, which was mandatory. <laughs> and I was a bit concerned, but it was a, and that was my beginning of, okay, well, this is a, they explained it to me like a teaching plant. This is going to open up the, the process of, um, and facilitate the healing, basically bringing ayahuasca in uh, from that context. So I listened to that one with tremendous interest because it's this plant that I was, I'm blanking on the name of the book. You mentioned it. There's a short book that came out a couple of years ago about um, tobacco uh, and its use mostly in Peru with curanderos. I can't remember the name of it. No. Uh, anyway. The, the, this, this is a book by Jeremy Narby that just came the, the out. Narby book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of compare and contrast ayahuasca and tobacco. Yes. It's a terrific read, really short, but really to the point. He has an indigenous co author, so it's yes. a very cool book all around. Yeah, and it is a short. I read that in Mexico just before heading in there because in advance yeah. I kind of knew this was going to happen. And the indigenous angle on tobacco I found fascinating because it is. Essentially, the, the destructive impact is our poor relation with it because it is a powerful plant that we have misused and appropriated and, and almost like press ganged into imperial service. And consequently, we get the results that we do in the West, which you don't get elsewhere. And I think it's such a powerful way of sitting with the presence of plants on, on our planet and, and how we relate to them, which is we, we've presumably for at least a couple of millennia, who knows, had a relationship with this plant. And it's in the last hundred years, it's started to uh, kill us en masse. So it's probably us <laughs> rather than the plant in that case. Well, I, I think we also have to bring up coca in that context. If you use it in its ritual a setting and do it the way the indigenous peoples do it, that you're not having a problem. It's when you purify it and stick it up your nose and pour all those nasty poisons in the forest rivers and streams, which you use to extract the cocaine, then, you know, here's this plant coming back to bite us, you know where. So I, I make this point repeatedly in, in, in Plants of the Gods and lectures and books that these plants have to be thought of as shamanic scalpels in the sense that they can help us and they can heal us. And they can hurt us. And, you know, every year, even more commonly now, with all this ayahuasca tourism, there's a story or two about some poor tourists went down there and, you know, didn't come back or didn't come back alive because they weren't with a real shaman or they didn't respect the plant or they overdid it. And this is the, the price we pay when we don't treat these plants as, as the sacred objects which they are. See, this interests me because when I consider the the arc of your career, or more specifically, your time in the field. If you consider the beginnings of it, it's almost like the justification for field work in the Amazon was to go and find active molecules. Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't necessarily looking for plants. You were looking for mostly alkaloids, but active molecules, because that was the only thing that was allowed to be real, if that makes sense. From a materialist perspective, 
beginning, if you if you look at, and this is almost Schultes and Rubber and the War, right? Like, um, mm. what is what is the utilitarian function or uh, role within capitalism of a plant? And that's a plant has value if it has some kind of active molecule. And if we look at where the field has hopefully gone, it's it's moved, I think, into something you just said, which is, well, actually, first of all, um, these are very chemically complex organisms. So we don't actually, when you, when you talk about one active molecule, yeah, let's let's slow down there. And 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 one that's the beginning of the nuance. But I also think we're at a point where culturally we are stepping back and going, we might be looking at this whole thing incorrectly, which is looking for active molecules rather than dare I say plant as a being. Has that been your experience in the in the decades you've been doing this work? Because if I think of your first book to the podcast, there's a okay. lot more demonstrating of the active molecules in some of the plants uh, that the shamans were showing you. And then when I listen to the podcast, it's more that, well, these plants are amazing organisms that need to be understood as that. Well, I did write Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice 30 years ago, so yeah. things have changed a bit since then. But also I think it's, it's a mistake to try and uh, gain people's interest by talking about the complexity of the rainforest and all the molecules. I mean, if you can talk about potential cures for cancer, COVID or AIDS, you can grip somebody's attention at the outset and then get into the more complex biocultural aspects from there. So I've been criticized by putting forward uh, too much of a utilitarian argument, but frankly, utilitarian argument uh, carries weight with the most people. And I don't think we should protect you know, the outback or, or, or the Okefenokee swamp just because it might have the cure for something in it. But I also know that the fact the cure might be there is going to have a broader appeal to people who are not interested in the aesthetics or the uh, eth ethical reasons or the uh, just sort of aesthetic, just a broad approach that you're talking about, which I think you and I obviously share. So it's a hook, but only yeah, one I of many. Yeah, no, it's an admirable tactic. I think also it is step one in a process, and the middle step is there's a there's a re-enchantment moment. So one of the things that I didn't know that I learned from the podcast was that beta blockers would not exist were it not for uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms. And there, there's a there's a lineage through to the point you can't quite say, but you also can't not say that it's. Uh, it's derived in a direct line <laughs> from psilocybin. But you can say we wouldn't have beta blockers if it wasn't for that. And millions of people are on these uh, on these medicines. And they're it's that so they're they're taking a psychedelic or a child of a psychedelic to heal a heart, which is amazing. That's that's it. I, I I when I learned that on the podcast, if someone is on beta blockers. There's a there's a reenchantment that happens, which is the medicine that you're on, is in some respects a gift from Maria Sabina and psilocybin and and this this wisdom, and I think that that helps people situate themselves in in that kind of living cosmos. What do you think? I think that we've done a pretty piss poor job of making our case to the general public. I've never yet met a physician who prescribed beta blockers who knew that they came out of compounds uh, extracted from Maria Sabina's mushrooms. As you said, it wasn't psilocybin. It was the compounds from that mushroom that were diddled in the lab that led to beta blockers. How many people that prescribe, how many doctors who prescribe statins know that they come out of a fungus? Okay, originally. Uh, nobody, at least none that I've met. So the, we have to get past this idea that hallucinations are important because they make you hallucinate. Uh, they're important for many reasons. And uh, a lot of these things have been studied in the lab, particularly poisons now, which I covered in my second book, Medicine Quest. They don't turn out to be a medicine, but they teach us something new about the human nervous system. Okay. And, and that's an important lesson in and of itself. And if you look at, uh, you know, Rachel, uh, uh, Machulam died last month, the Israeli, the Bulgarian Israeli chemist who, who found cannabinoids and cannabinoid receptors in the brains and stuff like that. And it wasn't like he'd get a new medicine out of cannabis, but there were lessons learned about the, the nervous system and the brain and receptors 
based on this research. So even if you've never smoked a joint, uh, you have benefited from research into cannabis and the compounds it, it, it contains. Yeah, it's it's such a, again, like it's a re-enchanting way of of being in the world to say you, these these plant healers and teachers have given you this life even if you don't know it. As you say, even if you don't ingest cannabis or, or smoke it in some way, you're still in a, uh, a post-research moment that has impacted other parts of your life. And I guess that brings me, it's funny you mentioned hallucinogens being important or entheogens being important outside of the fact that they can get you high. I uh, participated in a couple of uh, MAPS conferences and so on over the last few years to do with this nascent field of uh, using psychedelics in a Western therapeutic context. And I, uh, that's certainly new from uh, over, over the arc of your career, for instance, from mm. Richard Schulte's quote unquote discovering ayahuasca to now Johns Hopkins funding for uh, different research projects. But it, one of the things, and, and fortunately, I guess some of the leading lights in this field are tabling this as an area of concern. But we do face the risk of, of basically letting these things be active molecules and nothing else. And if we're going to do that with any <laughs> any Amazon plants, it's we should do that with these ones least. So I just wonder what your are you are you bullish on psychedelics and therapy? How are you feeling about it? What would you like to see? I was asked to give a commencement address at medical school a couple of years ago, and I interviewed the oldest shaman that I knew who was ninety two. And I said, how long did it take you to learn to master ayahuasca as a healing tool? And he said, well, I started drinking it when I was five, and I'm still learning. Okay, so the idea that somebody goes to Harvard Medical School and is going to learn how to heal with ayahuasca in a month or a year, I just don't think they're going to be able to learn it the same way and do the same things. That being said, you look at the success of Johns Hopkins, as you mentioned, and you see that in uh, even a laboratory context with proper training, uh, these things can heal. But I don't think it's either or. There's going to be some cases where anybody using psilocybin can heal something. And there's other cases where you got to go to southern Mexico and go to Oaxaca and go to Huautla, uh, where Schultes and Wasson were, and get the Mazatecs to treat you. So you need both those. But to circle back to your question, my worry about psychedelics these days are being oversold as the panacea for everything, for everyone. And that's not the case. And as you know, uh, these things can be very dangerous. They can be deleterious. My pal Michael Pollan's book, uh, Changing Your Mind, made the point very clearly that a lot of these people that go down to uh, Peru for this ayahuasca tourism are people whose spiritual needs are not being met by the West, whose religious needs are not being met by the West, but they're there for emotional problems. And they can come apart, especially when they're being treated by these renta shamans, which are all too common, who didn't have, you know, 85 years of training and know what to do if somebody gets in trouble. And as you know, anybody who has a lot of experience with psychedelics or hallucinogens or entheogens eventually has a bad, eventually has a bad trip. And you want that shaman there as a guardrail uh, to keep you from going over the edge and to pull you back uh, when it happens, because eventually it will happen, no matter how good the shaman is. And no matter how experienced you are. So I, I, I worry when I see ayahuasca for sale, uh, salvia divinorum for sale on the internet, and people think, well, if it's on the internet, I can just, you know, do it at home. Yeah, yeah. I um, When I was in Pucallpa, so that was yet last year, I was uh, talking to a local, and <laughs> we were looking across the road at another hotel, and someone pulled up in the trike and went in with some sort of a milk bottle, a plastic milk bottle filled with a grim looking liquid and then came back out. And I'm like, was that an ayahuasca drop? And they're like, yeah, you can buy it on Facebook here and uh, and just take it in your room. And I, that blew my mind because imagine traveling all the way to Pucallpa. <laughs> but it, uh, the, you know, the, the locals despair of it because it's like, you don't know what's in that. Uh, and and the, you're basically, this is no longer a medicine. You're buying a drug for a start. And you're sitting in your hotel room in Pucallpa drinking ayahuasca that you bought off Facebook is not is not the psychedelic future I'm, I'm uh, bullish for. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Another concern I have about these plants, these fungi, is overuse. 
And, you know, you look at ayahuasca, which is actually pretty easy to grow. It's not going to be wiped out by uh, all this demand, uh, but other things might be. Peyote is probably number one on my worry list because it's a small and slow growing cactus with a very small distribution. So that we have to find ways of mitigating the impact on these natural populations. And in some cases like peyote, you have San Pedro, which has many of the same compounds, which I think would be a pretty suitable substitute. Now, I'm not a shaman, so don't take this as medical or ethnomedical advice, but there may be some relatively easy answers to some of these problems. I mean, the first an easy answer is don't do peyote unless you're a member yeah. of the Native American church or invited to by a peyote shaman of the one of the three peyote tribes in Mexico. Um, with something like ayahuasca, you have to be less concerned about environmental impact, but you have to be at least, if not more so, concerned about the mental and emotional impact. And you shouldn't be doing it in a hotel room by yourself. No. <laughs> well, that brings me to one of the things that was tabled at the last conference I was at. Uh, online conference, because again, it was during those three years that uh, birthed your podcast. Um, the Western therapy model is 115 years old and is based mm -hmm. on um, a man who looks like Freud sitting next to you on a fainting couch, no right. touching, on your own, one right. therapist, one patient. And what was discussed at the conference, and certainly been my experience, is that you will never, in an indigenous context, find these things taken alone. Uh, this is a, ayahuasca is a good example, right? It, well, this, outside of a triage situation, ayahuasca mm -hmm. is a communal event. It is a, a communal healing. Because the notion that one person is sick rather than an illness being part of a, a tribe or a group or a family is itself this Western idea. So this was one of the things they tabled, which I've been sitting with as a, as a potential concern, which is that it, it may well, in fact, I'll go further and say, I consider it very likely that some of the healing effects will lose their efficacy if we try to move them into a therapist, patient, no touching, sitting in a room. If a therapist takes you out to a park during a session in New York, I learned this, he or she can lose their license. That everything has to be done in, in a clinical setting with no touching. And that's not the right model, <laughs> I think, to, uh, to give psychedelics the best chance to, to heal in this new context. What do you think? Uh, in my experience, what you're saying is largely true, but not completely. I have had ceremonies one-on-one uh, -on -one or one-on-two. -on so I do think that the, 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 the sort of communal model is much more common, at least in the, the tribes that I've had the opportunity and honor to work with or live with. But, you know, you, you, you learn to say never say never because there's 400 different groups in the Amazon and we haven't studied all of them. But yes, to a large degree, you're absolutely correct. And, um, you know, we'll see what the future holds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of the Amazon, this is a really unfair question. Uh, <laughs> and I, I want to talk about uh, the conservation work and, and so on in a moment. But I want to ask the unfair question first, because I'd love to know, do you have a favorite place or, or a favorite part in, in the Amazon? Well, I do, it, without even needing to think about it very long. My favorite is the village of Kwamala Samutu in southwest Suriname on the Brazil border. I've been working there since 1982. I've grown up with some of those people. I know them longer than my, my wife and kids. Um, and there are many different tribes living there. I know the flora pretty well. And I have a relationship with these people where I don't have to sit around and drink the dreaded cassava beer to make friends and prove that I'm a good guy. So uh, that's been the wellspring of a lot of my career. And I've had a great opportunity to travel from Mexico to, to Brazil. But that's where most of my time and work and effort has been spent. And, you know, I mean, I'm still learning new plants there, which means that they're still holding back other plants on me. But it just shows how deep the well is of this knowledge and, and how complex these things are. So the that's a great answer, and I guess not surprising. That brings me to something that is in the first book, which is because there, you know, there are 400 groups uh, in the Amazon, give or take, some of them have a more complex pharmacopoeia than others. And I do recall in the book, you mentioned 
I just want to know if they, this hypothesis or thesis has changed, that the ones that have a, a, a less complex uh, or a shorter list of healing plants work more in a, I guess, shamanic, energetic sense? Would you say that's still the case? Because I'm very interested in that from an Aboriginal perspective in Australia, where, again, there's a limited, compared to other Indigenous groups around the world, uh, pharmacopoeia, a list of healing plants. But the, the thing is, at time of first contact or invasion, they were probably the healthiest people on earth in terms of lean protein, sunlight. <laughs> they were a foot taller than the British when they showed up. So they didn't get as sick <laughs> is one of the reasons. And the, and the pharmacopoeia includes ceremony and eating the right foods as well as we have this idea that, because it's true, but like plants heal, food nourishes. And it, it breaks down in, in traditional Aboriginal Australia into those, those categories break down. And I'm just wondering where... Are you still, is that still the probable idea as to why there are more complex pharmacopoeias somewhere, like the greater exposure to certain diseases here versus there, and that's how it works? Well, as a scientist, I have to point out that there's been very few in-depth multi-year studies done of any tribes in the Amazon. So we're, 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 we're extrapolating from a very small database. And what I have found is that even within a single village, within a single sub-tribe, Shamans may use different plants or different dosages or different preparations. So I, I, it, clearly everything in Amazonia, when people say, do shamans do this, do shamans think that? I mean, people are people, you know, they're very different. I mean, ayahuasca is the thing in the Northwest Amazon, but it's not native to the Eastern Amazon, probably not to the Southwestern Amazon. So you can't say all shamans use ayahuasca, which is a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, in the Southeast, they're, they're tobacco healers. That's their hallucinogen of choice, again, in my experience. Um, so I'm not sure that their ethnopharmacopoeia is not as rich. They just haven't been studied in depth. I will say this. Uh, one of the shamans with whom I've been working since 1982 has shown us over 300 plants mm. that he knows and uses. That means there's probably still more out there that he knows and uses, but there's they're just the studies are still lacking, even as this knowledge is disappearing, even as these cultures are being crushed by modernity, even as these forests are being put to the torch. So the the, the great sad aspect of this is that we're burning the candle at two ends. One is ever growing appreciation for natural products, shamanic wisdom, hallucinogens. The other is we're burning the rainforest. We're destroying these cultures. Um, and the question is, you know, where, where, where are these two different forces going to meet? Yeah. Well, that, I think, brings us neatly to the Amazon conservation team. I mean, tell us the, tell us the origin story uh, of, of the organization. Well, we're all refugees from other conservation organizations. I used to work at the World Wildlife Fund, a very good place. My co-founder, Liliana, worked at the Nature Conservancy. They do a lot of good things. But these were nature protection organizations. It was all about whales and elephants and trees, which is great. And then you had groups like Cultural Survival, Survival International, focusing on indigenous cultures, which was great. But they never talked to each other. And I could see that 25% of the Amazon was in indigenous lands, but nobody was helping these people protect their forests. So we set up the Amazon Conservation Team 26 years ago to address this need. We called it biocultural conservation. So our basic um, conclusion was that these indigenous peoples are the best stewards of their ecosystems. And what they need is some help from the outside world. It could be training, could be tech tools, could be funding, but it shouldn't be the white man going in there and say what to do and what not to do. I mean, we've tried that from Australia to the Americas and that hasn't worked so well, has it? Yeah. And so the idea is to try and create space for them to figure out how to deal with the outside world on their own. And the analogy I used with a chief I talked to recently, I said, we're not going to tell you what to do or what not to do. We'll ride shotgun. Okay, we'll sit next to you. We'll read the map. We'll make recommendations where to go. But ultimately, it's got to be your decision. And we have now had the uh, opportunity to work and partner with over 100 different groups in, in South America, mostly Amazonia, but some on the outskirts, um, and have helped them map and, and improve management and protection of their lands. That's over 90 million acres of ancestral rainforest. That's amazing. That's yeah. That's such powerful work. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, it what I what I like. Obviously, I like everything about that. But what I'm very interested in is the inextricability of 
And I don't even like, it. it's one of those philosophical things, culture, nature, it's all just us. It's all just organisms, right? But what I like about the approach is the understanding or awareness of the inextricability of what we would call intellectual property. And that's something I'm very interested in. I'd like to get your, your steer on over the course of the career, the growing understanding of, uh, well, we've been talking about it this whole time, uh, Schultes, however amazing he was, didn't discover anything. He had, well, he did, but like he didn't discover ayahuasca. It was, uh, it was shown to him. It was something that was taught. So it's it's indigenous IP. How, I mean, how has that changed? How has that awareness changed? I guess in in the industry uh, over over the course of your career. And are you bullish? Are you excited? What would you like to see change in? In the, in the journey of a plant existing in an indigenous culture in the Amazon to beta blockers 2.0, uh, what would you like to see? What What is the perfect uh, journey for something like that, you think? Well, I'd like to see something we, we touched on a bit earlier, which is on the one hand, you can go to the doctor and get a psilocybin tablet and, and he or she walks you through your session. And the other, you go down to... Oaxaca and have a Mazatec uh, treat your ailment that the, that the physician wasn't able to disagree. Both options should be out there. But first and foremost, the beneficiaries have to be the indigenous peoples or the peasant peoples that taught us these plants because they're the ones who are typically uh, cut out of the equation. When you look at something like psilocybin, I don't know how it is in Australia, but people are trying to launch billion dollar companies mm -hmm. to capitalize on psilocybin. But the amount of monies that are going back to the people who taught us psilocybin, which is uh, the Mazatecs and the Chinantecs and the Zapotecs, aren't getting anything. And when I tell people we need to help these, these folks, they're like, oh, just tell us how to do this and give us the information and tell us where to find the mushrooms, and then we'll give them something, you know, 12 years from now. That's not uh, acceptable in, in my book or probably in your book or any other ethnobotanist book. So we, it, to, to use an analogy I like a lot, it's kind of like peace in the Middle East. We know what it would look like, okay? The outlines are pretty clear. It's just the devil is in the damn details, which is why it's, it hasn't been done successfully. So that we want to live in a world where the, the cultural diversity is protected. We want to live in a world where the biological diversity is protected. We want to live in a world where the knowledge of how to use these things is protected and shared amongst everybody if it's done in a fair and equitable way. And that can be a drug on, on, the, uh, on the shelf of a pharmacy in, in, in your capital city, or it can be an herb that you buy uh, in, in, in the uh, hippie food store. But in all cases, I wanna make sure that it's collected sustainably, that it benefited the people that collected it, that it's full uh, or, or that it's not full of the junk that these Chinese herbs are that we find increasingly full of toxic, nasty stuff because there's not enough controls. And that, you know, we're getting reliable information. I mean, you can go on the internet and find all sorts of bad information about herbs. Uh, there was a big scandal during COVID where people started thinking that quinine was great for uh, COVID, which as far as I know from the science I've seen, it's not. Uh, but uh, it went on the internet and people started buying it. Uh, look at this horse stuff that people started selling. So we need to make sure there's reliable information that the, that the, the plants and the fungi are clean, that it's not just for our benefit, it's for their benefit as well. I mean, again, it's, like I said, it's peace in the Middle East. We know what the outline should look like, but if it was so easy, why haven't we been doing it right up till now? No, absolutely. I think about the episodes. I learned so much, I think in particular, the episodes about curare in in the podcast, because there are psilocybin or, or mushrooms containing psilocybin or fungus containing uh, psilocybin is almost a, a, an uncomplicated example. And I don't think people quite realize the complexity of the intellectual property we're talking about. And it's, it's evident in Curare, especially, which is, this is as complex an intellectual property as a Hollywood film. <laughs> this, this is uh, this isn't just like oh, here's a plant you can use. This is combinations that have been honed and are kept secret and are used in a really precise way that have powerful effects on on animals that they hunt, whatever it happens to be. But I mean, tell us because uh, Curare is the most 
amazing idea and an amazing world. But tell tell people about that, I think. Well, curare is one of the few words in the English language that comes from Amazonian lingo. Uh, in the Amazon, it's known as urari, urasi, urali. So I, I, there aren't many words in English that come from Amazon dialects. That's one of them. Curare is an arrow poison. There's two major forms. One is strychnose-based. One is moonseed-based. The moonseed-based from the botanical family Menispermaceae was early adopted into abdominal surgery as a muscle relaxant. If you tried to do surgery, the muscles would tighten and cause other problems. But curare, which kills by relaxing your muscles, particularly your diaphragm, and you suffocate uh, in small amounts, uh, makes this type of surgery possible. And none of the benefits ever flow to the indigenous peoples who taught us that. I mean, the problem is we learned it uh, 400 years ago. So it wasn't like a recent thing. But it's when, when you look at things like the magic frogs, the hallucinogenic frogs, which were discovered discovered uh, just a few decades ago, that should be a little easier to figure out the intellectual property rights and who should benefit from all these things showing up on the internet and all of these uh, wacky uh, encounter sessions in California using these compounds from this frog. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I learned so much from it. I thought it was really interesting. And it, it kind of put pieces together with Wade Davis's book, Lost Amazon, and, and hearkening back to uh, Schulte's work with it, which I guess brings me to something. If, if we look at your first book and your origin story with Harvard and how you ended up doing field work and, and getting into the degree, it's um, passion based. You were working there at the time and, and had interest in things. And th this is Harvard. <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is one of the two best universities in the world. And I assume it's not quite like that anymore to, to get into a field like ethnobotany. And I, part of that is the, you know, the great pirate captain that was Schultes, I guess, to some extent. But what do you... <clears throat> What do you think is good about where ethnobotany is today? And what do you maybe lament <laughs> uh, has changed? Well, what's good about it is there's so much interest in it. And part of this is due to the psychedelic renaissance. Part of this is due to a green forest deforestation. So people are interested in this stuff like it, that they never were before. Uh, the bad news is when Schultes retired, he wasn't replaced. Harvard didn't consider it important enough to, to keep that chair open. And Harvard's not suffering for money, you know. They just didn't think about this. It was sort of 19th century natural history, old fashioned. Who cares about this stuff? Well, they were wrong. Uh, but this harkens back to another piece I wrote on uh, Hamilton Rice. Hamilton Rice is the greatest Amazon explorer you've never heard of. Hamilton Rice explored the Northwest Amazon in 1907, made the first map of Chiribiquete, later explored by Schultes. The reason that's relevant to, to your question is that he married a very, very rich woman and used her money to invent mapping from the air. So he started mapping the Amazon from the air. And when he retired, Harvard didn't replace him. So I guess they didn't see there was any future in mapping from the air. And I guess that Google Earth didn't get the memo. Yeah. So well, I'm not the very interested in my own, like, so they, they dropped the ball. Yeah, it's crazy. And you think, well, that just reminded me of. Uh, the use of LIDAR in, in Mayan archaeology, which is something else I'm, I'm really interested in. <laughs> yeah. Nope, can't learn anything mapping from the air, that's for sure. <laughs> Crazy. Well, I was on the expedition that found the city, the lost monkey god. So oh, if you're in LIDAR and rainforest exploration, check it out. This this lost city had been searched for since, I don't know, was it Pizarro or Cortez? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Nobody, Charles Lindbergh flew over the Central American rainforest looking for this lost city. And with LIDAR, uh, once all the data had been collected, it took us 15 minutes to find it. We knew right where to drop the helicopter. It's amazing. Yeah. That, this is something that I, I have a considerable interest in. There's a book that came out maybe about 10 years ago, but eight or nine years ago in Australia called The Greatest Estate on Earth. And it's the story of how managed this entire continent was by the Aboriginal nations who lived here. When the British showed up, they commented that it looked like a capability brown parkland because you could walk between the trees and it was all natural looking but elegant. And, and the soil was spongy to the depth of, of one foot in and around Sydney in places that's now rock <laughs> because, of, because of how 
what they thought was a natural landscape was anything but. When it comes to realizing the extent of Maya civilization and even earlier Amazonian civilizations, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in, we have that romantic, literal 19th century romantic idea of pristine nature, but this is <laughs> yep. home and gardens. And if you look at the the actual distribution of quote unquote useful plants in the Amazon, what you actually see yeah. is is that a relationship that's plainly gone back centuries upon centuries of, of humans and plants organizing each other, which gets lost if we decimate them uh, or if, if cultures collapse or what have you. But when you look across what looks like impenetrable, untouched jungle, it's somebody's overgrown garden in, in many respects. And it, we just, I'm haunted by that. I'm haunted by how by the dual lesson in, in that approach, which is, yeah, we can't even see it when it's right in front of us because we have this pristine nature filter. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, I hope you'll put that uh, book you're mentioning in the show notes because I'd like to read that. I did read the song lines. I even read Mutant Message Down Under uh, oh, when right. it came out. But <laughs> um, I think this whole idea of the Amazon being Central Park has been oversold. Clearly, there was much more impact on the Amazon uh, than people thought 100 years ago or 50 years ago. But the idea that all of it is just an overgrown garden is, is definitely not true. I mean, you got to remember the Amazon's a big place. It's the size of the continental U.S. So archaeologists digging in Death Valley a thousand years from now will say, they no, there was no life there. Uh, versus if they're digging in Manhattan, they'll say the continent was covered with billions of people. So this idea of the... Um, Amazon as a garden is certainly true to some extent, but not completely as some people have made it out to be. There's a great quote in, in my most recent book, The Amazon, What Everybody Needs to Know, from a, a, a fellow, I think his name is Josh Barlow, an English a scientist who looked at this from a basin-wide perspective and said this, what I'm saying, which is that, yeah, some of it was definitely deforested and has lots of ruins in it, and other was pretty much untouched. Yeah, I think... Well, I mean, as you say, it's a big place. <laughs> that would be the, the same with the Maya as well. Uh, you, they would have causeways and and you know stuff cut between the jungles, in between cities, um, and what have. The Maya is a different case. Central America was definitely much more populated than it is now. Yeah, you had sure. these so-called high civilizations like the Mayans and the Olmecs, and in in South America, you know, you had the you had the Incas, mm -hmm. uh, you had the Chichas, but the rest of the Amazon, you did not have. Uh, a, a bunch of Machu Picchus. Uh, we'd have found them by now, thanks to LIDAR and other uh, remote sensing technology. Nice. So do you think the world of ethnobotany or anthropology or, or any of the related fields, do you think there's room in that world for uh, another Schultes, another adventurer who can, what was it, 11 years, nine years he spent <laughs> living in the Amazon? Okay. Okay, right. You know, he'd be hard pressed. He was there on the cusp of change. And the, the idea that you could make all that contact with uncontacted peoples and find all these new hallucinogens, you'd be hard pressed to do that. But like I said, you should never say never. But I think he was at a special moment that just doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, it's a it's kind of a trick question because does anybody ever say yes when they say, is there going to be another. Uh, uh, Elon Musk, mm. maybe that's not the best example, but you know what I'm saying. Will there ever be another Babe Ruth? Well, you have Hank Aaron, who had even more homers, but he was using a different bat and the stadiums were different shapes. So uh, I guess the simple answer is no, uh, but there's a lot of us uh, traveling in his uh, footsteps. And when I went to Columbia one time, uh, a, sh a shaman told me, he said, well, you, you, like many of the students, have traveled in his footsteps, but now here in the Colombian jungle, you can follow in his footprints. Oh, that's awesome. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so. Cool. so I guess the, the last question, coming back to the podcast and Schulte's in a way, uh, did you... Did you learn anything new uh, putting the podcast together? Podcast together so far is returning to that information in a new format, or or sitting with that understanding and the memories. Did Did you learn anything new that 
uh, warrants mentioning. About shortage or about the, the plants in general? Either plants or just the, the journey, because I've been podcasting for years. I, I fortunately yeah. get to ask guests well, like you, yourself and learn a bunch, but like, did you learn anything? Did you learn anything new revisiting, I guess, that of in a, in a new format? Well, the answer is yes to both, because Ayahuasca, which is the first episode, which is the most popular episode, I sat down with a couple of notes and I just winged it. Okay, there's no editing, essentially. Uh, on tobacco, it took a lot of work because there's so much. You know what it's like trying to get your arms around a ginormous subject like that. And I'm not a big tobacco fan. Uh, I do it when offered in a ritual ceremony, but I haven't made a deep study of it, which I had to do to prepare for the podcast, which ended up as two episodes. So, yeah, I mean, all that stuff's not in my head. And for me, the fun of this, and I'm sure it's the same with you, it's like doing a Ph.D., because you take a subject you love and you want to learn more about it. And of course, you have to be sort of an intellectual magpie because some of it is in the scientific literature and some of it is stories and some of it's in other podcasts. So yeah, I'm continuously learning new things, which makes it uh, fun and exciting. In terms of Schulte, some of the stuff was new as well because I just did a paper for Dennis McKenna. Dennis, Dennis has been on your podcast, no? No, not yet. Uh, we've, I, we've I'm happy to help with that. Um, mm -hmm. But Dennis did the ethnopharmacologic search for new psychiatric drugs, 1955, which is 55 years after Schultes and Hoffman did the first one in San Francisco. And so I was forced to go into the herbarium at Harvard uh, and, and find the actual notes where Robert Graves, the poet, uh, sent oh, Schultes' paper to Wasson, which was the sort of missing connective tissue. I was not only able to, I was able to find the goddamn paper with, you know, Graves' notes to, to Wasson uh, and make the connections. So, yeah, I mean, that, that may not find the cure for cancer, but as an intellectual exercise, it was a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, that's so cool. Did you meet Wasson? Did I, did I imagine that? What about him? Did you Say meet again? Gordon Wasson? Yes, I did. Uh, he was an amazing character, quite cantankerous. And when he would come to the museum, it was like the King of England showing up. Oh, we have to get Mr. Wasson's cookies. You know, he likes to have those those Pepperidge Farm cookies. And let's make sure we have the right tea. So, yeah, I do him. I mean, I can't say I know him well, but I met him on many occasions. No, that's that's amazing. But to, to be, yeah, I guess the, to be downstream from Schultes and Wasson and Maria Sabina and all their people is amazing. I think that's really cool. Yeah, it, uh, for, for me or for any of us in this field, it was like being in Florence during the Renaissance, if you're interested in art. Yeah, you know. that's so cool. Yeah. So one of the episodes that I really enjoyed was the episode with Brian Murarescu. And I could tell, I could detect the excitement in your voice that we might be at a moment, because again, I mean, he's, he's standing on the shoulders of uh, people who've made that case before. And I always thought were well, correct, broadly speaking, correct. Uh, I could detect some excitement in your voice discussing with Brian the, the thesis that psychedelics uh, underpin a lot more of human culture and particularly in a European sense, because we know in an Amazonian and other places sense than, than people realize. And that was at least contentious in the, uh, the squeamish 19th century uh, antiquarian world, but the evidence continues to stack up that it's the case. Do you think, I mean, uh, tell us about that. Are, you, are, you, are we bullish that we might actually get, finally get that sea change in our understanding of European history, early European history that, we have similar plant interactions to what we might find elsewhere? Well, I think the, the key, how should I put it, the key anecdote in, the, in this whole story is when Carl Ruck, who was a classic scholar at BU, proposed that the Ellicinian mysteries were based on Ergot, uh, and he was shouted down by the president of the, of the, of the college because this guy was uh, radically conservative and the idea that the Greeks, the fathers of, of Western civilization, were tripping their brains out was just anathema to him. And also, he had issues with the fact that this fellow uh, was openly uh, gay and, 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 and just sort of tried to stop him at, at, at every opportunity. Fortunately, he had tenure, so he couldn't fire him because he was long gone. 
And so when more rescue started investigating this stuff, we have these modern tools of technology. We can test some of these finds to see what they have in them. And of course, the problem he ran into is what do they do in a museum when they dig something up is they wash it. So he was smart enough to go to a dig in northern Spain where they dug up this goblet and he said, don't wash it and had it tested. It was full of organ alkaloids so yeah. that uh, rock then becomes like uh, like, you know, Galileo proven right, but in his own lifetime, not having to wait hundreds of years to find out that, yes, the earth does revolve around the sun, no matter what the church says. And I think it's a perfect analogy to what we have here, to a lot of the stuff which seems sort of wacky uh, theories come up with drug-addled people in Harvard Square, turns out to have been right. And that the more studies we have, the more evidence we have uh, that all of this is undergirded by hallucinogens. I talked in the in the cannabis episode about finding an altar near Jerusalem that was full of cannabis. Mm. Now, does that mean that Judaism was based on cannabis? No, of course not. But it does mean that somebody somewhere was using this stuff, you know, back when Moses uh, walked the Holy Land, so that uh, we know it's true for Judaism, we know it's true for Christianity, thanks to Brian and Karl Ruck's work. Now there's a fellow... Uh, Shaheen Atenum, who's looking at Zoroastrianism and finding some of the same alkaloids in Syrian Ru, which are the same in alkaloids, which was sort of what in some ways was a predecessor of Islam. So I think all of these uh, religions and cultures are going to be found to have something to do with these mind-altering substances. And if they don't, so what? You know, it just shows that part of human nature is to get outside yourself. And whether it's it's, it's Sufi dancing or meditation or fasting or mental illness, uh, whatever, that all of these altered senses play a key role in, in creativity and religion, uh, art, and, and science. Remember, it was Kerry Mullis who, who found, uh, developed the PCR reaction, did it on a motorcycle after spending all night tripping with LSD. Yeah. So Francis Crick, you know, all yeah. Of yeah, <laughs> all together. That's what makes this stuff so endless, and that's why we're talking about it now, right? No, absolutely. Well, Doctor Pluckin, I've kept you long enough, and that's such a fantastic place to end because it's it's positive and and exciting and and, and invitational for people. But uh, for those who'd like to know more about the podcast and the organization and anything else you've got going on, lay it on us. Where can they where can they catch up with you, find what you're doing, that kind of stuff? Well, I have my own webpage, markplotkin.com, which has a lot of my writings that aren't related to rainforest conservation. The Amazon conservation team has a website, amazonteam.org. I'm easily findable on the web. Just look up my name. And the podcast is called Plants of the Gods, Hallucinogens, Healing, Culture, and Conservation. It's all the major platforms, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher. So the stuff is, is, is not hard to find or it shouldn't be. No, absolutely. And thanks once again. I have been a fan of yours for as long as I can remember. I love the books. I love the podcast. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.